Connor from the Gitcoin team. We have Vivek from the Gitcoin team. Uh, then we have Chase and Paul here uh, from OP Games or Alto. And uh, they're going to talk a little bit about blockchain gaming, um, what they're working on their company, uh, possibly with a little demo, and then hopefully uh, show us uh, a little more about what their, what their bounties are all about and, and give us any tips on those. So um, thanks, everyone, for joining. And uh, Chase, Paul, take it away. Yeah. Right. And just one thing that I would ask if you guys could introduce yourselves, just like a brief background before sure. you got into crypto, how you got here and um, yeah, where you're based. Perfect. Um, I guess I'll start, Paul. Um, so my name is Chase. Uh, I'm the CEO of um, OP Games. Uh, Paul and I met a couple of years ago, maybe about five years ago. Um, the way OP Games and Alto started was um, one of my, my other co-founders, Gabby, um, who is a uh, a veteran game developer in the Philippines, and I was a game publisher in China. Um, so we met, I think it's in GDC. Um, he pitched one of his games to me. Um, he usually published about 12 games per year. Um, and so I interfaced with a lot of game developers, particularly on whether or not we publish a game, uh, specifically from the developers we work with. So Gabby was one of them. And um, we became friends. Um, unfortunately, I did not publish his game. Um, it was something that I wasn't ready to publish just yet because it's a kind of a casual game, mid-core game. But um, soon after a couple of years, um, we decided, you know what, Chase, there's something we can work on together. You, you're into blockchain. I'm into blockchain. We're both into games. Um, let's bring Paul as well. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that's how it all started. Um, year we're we're in year three or year two somehow right now in terms of um when we started um alto and op games um so we started off with non-fungible tokens and now we're working on um so that's still there nfts but now we're working more on game tournaments um, and uh, an sdk that would allow game developers to easily include blockchain to their games that's pretty much interesting it. thanks yeah that's awesome there, there's a lot of questions I could ask off that, but we'll, we'll save them for later. All right, no worries. Cool. cool. All right, I, I think I can just start sharing my screen as well. Cool. Can everyone see it? Yep. Yep. All right. Okay, so uh, as Connor and Chase mentioned, we'll be talking today about uh, some about blockchain games, and uh, I wanted to focus on uh, decentralizing video games because whenever Chase and I talk to developers, a lot of the developers we talk to aren't really in the same space as us, and it's really um, it really takes some time for them to understand why we need blockchain in the games industry, and so I am using decentralizing video games as something that might be able to get them more into the mindset of Web3 and decentralization. So for everyone who wants to just check out the slides with me, I put up the link in there. All right, and maybe to add more to how Chase intro uh, Outplay or OP Games. OP Games is Outplay Games. Our site is there, outplay.games. And uh, yeah, we do, uh, we do we allow non-blockchain game developers to get into the blockchain by teaching them how to create crypto game tournaments. So uh, to start with, I, I lead non-blockchain game developers to see like what the benefit of decentralization is. And one clear, the, benefit to them when I talk to people who haven't really gone into blockchain that much is that it's really something we can use to avoid platform lock-in. So, so as a brief intro to how the game industry works, a lot of games now are downloaded by app stores. And most of the time, that's really, that's really the main way that you discover and download games. And uh, when you go through the app stores, a lot of the value from players that need to go into the developers really have to go through these app stores. 
So if you've downloaded a game recently, for example, uh, Candy Crush, you see that uh, a lot of the monetization that happens on these games are through in-app purchases, which is when you buy uh, when you buy microtransactions through the App Store to get an item or to get consumables in the game. Or if the game isn't really monetized by in-app purchase, it's monetized by uh, social networks or ad networks. So you see that when you play a game and then sometimes they put up an ad for you to watch while you're playing the game. So in this, in this um, ecosystem, we see that there's really not a direct relationship between a player and developer most of the time and it has to go through the, the app store and this is fine in some cases but in in some cases this really affects how games are designed and it really doesn't lead to a, a very sustainable economy so when platforms are locked in it really descends this incentivizes their improvement. And we're actually seeing this right now in a lot of, uh, when you look at uh, like games forums or in, in some of the games that I play, I, I follow them on Reddit, for example. And you see people really aren't that happy now with how the games industry is going. For, for example, this is one of the games I'm playing, Dragon Ball Legends. And some people are, because of the, how, how the way these games are designed, some of them are really complaining. Like some of them have are having actually mental issues because of these games and how they're designed. Because they're like tugging at the like what makes these games uh, very addictive to and to get you to really pay in app transaction. And people are now, mm. they want to go back to how games were before, where you had to play these games to earn items. Mm. We see this now affecting uh, regulation as well. Like Belgium has banned some of the monetizations that are happening in games. And um, mm. for developers, sometimes this, uh, this ecosystem isn't really as, um, as good as well. I, I put up this slide over on the right on the top 10 games in the app stores. And currently, these games actually have been there for three years. Like the top 10 is just the same games. So there's not a lot of innovations that are happening because of the way the current ecosystems are designed. So, so yeah, so that was why we should decentralize video games and now how do we decentralize them and it's actually a like a big question and we need to essentially change how the economics work and this isn't this is really a big um discussion but for now i wanted to focus on what us as developers can do and this slide shows like what are the components of a video game that we can look at and decentralize? And for now, we can focus on using and creating open source alternatives. So that prevents us from being trapped in a platform. And two is to be as cross-platform as possible, which prevents our players to be trapped in that platform. That's interesting. It's, it's really a trap on both sides. Um, both yeah, for the players and for the builders. Yeah. Um, I never thought about it like that. Yeah, so, yeah, and I talked to some people and players as well. Like, I put out this post on why we should decentralize video games. And some don't really see it. Like, some don't see it, don't see the platform, don't see the economics, because you just want to play games, right? Or you just want to create something, you want to create a game that people will play. But there's mm -hmm. really... Um, a lot of things going on in the back end that you, could, you should be aware of so you know how the future will unfold in the industry. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, so, so next, I guess as a clear example, I wanted to go to uh, an example of a game that we would probably know. Like this game on the left is mm -hmm. Flappy Bird. 
And some trivia on it, Flappy Bird is already six years old. So it made wow. me feel a bit old. <laughs> yeah, it's already, it's six years old already? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Funny. And uh, it was made by Dong Nguyen, a Vietnamese game developer. And when Flappy Bird became famous, there were a lot of trolls that were angry at him because the game was so hard. And also that it was such a viral hit that he was earning thousands of dollars a day. <laughs> So he, he got a lot of trolls and he took it down from the App Store after a few months, I think, or a year. Really? I didn't know he took it down. Yeah, he took it down. So if you look for Flappy Bird on the App Store, there'll be a lot of clones, but not, not the original one. Okay, original. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So I took that game and then I wanted to break down the components of the game and so we can see what, what points it centralized. And where we could possibly decentralize each of these, par these parts. So at a high level, we have a, a game, like a mobile game that you download from the App Store, can be broken down in, into these components. The, the client, the game client, which is the APK that you installed in your phone. It's where you play the actual game itself. And then the game server. So most of the time, games have to install an SDK. In this case, it's the Google Play Game Services, which supports, uh, which allows you to add stuff like leaderboards, achievements, and also to identify players, so you, they, you know which accounts they're tied to. And then the last one is the deployment platform. In this case, the Google Play Store, which is where you download the game, where people discover it, and which supports in-app purchases for the developer to monetize the game. So, so going through each of those components, how would we possibly decentralize each of those parts? So we need to identify how are we centralized in these components. So for the APK install, since it's an APK, we're dependent on Android and most users will install via the Google Play Store. So to remove the dependency, you have to think about like does our choice of technology add to these dependencies? For example, what are the game engines that are usually used for App Store games? A lot of people use Unity, which uh, can easily create these APKs. Um, if you use something like a web-based engine, you won't be able to make these APKs, but it would be, uh, it could easily deploy on other platforms like the web. Another uh, de dependency that we could look at is the asset formats we use in the game. Like some 3D formats, for example, like FBX, they're, uh, they're very tied to the native, uh, native installs. But if yeah. you use open formats like GLTF, then that's something that would be supported in other platforms. So the next is uh, the game server. Like how would we want to decentralize the game server? So if you look at the Google Play game services, players will need a Google account. Their data is tied to how Google formats their leaderboards. It's not something that you can really port away from their infrastructure. So to is, it, is it possible the, that Google could help with this though, if they were interested? Like in terms of like, you know, one Google account Somehow. Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah, um, I haven't really looked deeply at how to like, like move everything away from Google once you're in there. But, but yeah, but if it's something that they want to make like cross, yeah, cross portable, yeah. Because the we problem would just, is, we, we would have to convince them. They are, they're not going to do it for, for no reason. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is true. That is true. Yeah. That's the it has to benefit them somehow. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, like for example, they stopped supporting. I think the allowing Google Play games on their on iOS. Like they stopped supporting the SDK. Mm -hmm. So there's really not an incentive for them to try to get people away from their platform. Yeah. Makes yeah. Sense. So so yeah. So just to think about that while you're making your game servers. And then uh, the last one is the deployment platform. So again, 
players need a Google account, it's permission. Like whenever you need uh, to put up an update, it has to go through QA. Not as much in Google, but in the iOS store, for example, there's a lot of delay that goes through when you're creating an update. Uh, but, but some questions are still there. Like, how do we still enable payments? Because a lot of the payments for games are done through these stores. And how do we still allow the user to discover our games? Because a lot of user discovery happens through the App Store nowadays. Yeah. So looking at each of those components, I selected some like technologies we can possibly use to do that versus the ones that were used before. So for a game client, instead of using an native APK install, we can look at using HTML5 on browser. For a game server, instead of using like something closed source like Google Play services, you can look at what open source multiplayer servers exist and use them. And deploying in a deployment platform, since which we are using HTML5 on browser, we can deploy on the web. And I'll go to, so yeah, so these are just technology choices that I selected, but uh, using the questions that we did before, then we can probably see some other technologies that might make sense. Got it. Got and it. Then, okay. And, yeah. and do you think like, like open source multiplayer, ser multiplayer servers would, would work at scale, you know, if a game really takes off? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think so. The, the challenge there is you're going to have to like use other technologies as well. Like uh, you're going to have to host it somewhere in Cloudflare or DigitalOcean, for example. So that's another mm -hmm. platform altogether. But at least the open source server is something that is easily portable across these infrastructures. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What stood out to Makes me sense. here is I, you know, I, I know about your bounty. I know you're incentivizing people to build HTML5 games, but this yeah. puts it in a, a broader context uh, as yeah. somebody who now like understands the reason why you're, you're intrigued by HTML5 games, which is, mm -hmm. which is that it is a more decentralized uh, option than, than gameplay. Exactly. Yeah. So that's been a challenge for us also is trying to get more people into HTML5 because a lot of game developers really have coalesced around Unity, around the app stores. And it's something that we have to build up to be able to reach the same scale as what the app stores are. And is it because HTML5 is, is harder to build on, less tools? Yes, yeah. And Unity is just so rich now that there's a lot of, there's an asset store, for example, where you can get, buy a lot of libraries and assets. So it, it takes it. it takes more work to make an HTML5 game to the same quality of a native game. Got it. Got it. And HTML5, I take it, is open source, correct? Yeah, it's it. it's mostly it's mostly just JavaScript on your browser, and you can use some other libraries. I I can go I'll go through a list of some other libraries that you can use on top, cool. like like cool. what you can use versus Unity. Got it. Sorry, we keep interrupting. I hope this is okay. We just <laughs> yeah, it's fine. I, I like okay. the questions. So, cool. Sounds yeah, so good. Just a few more slides and then some, like I, I link to some source in our GitHub that people can check out. All right. So, so I'll just go through each of them again and then I'll identify some tools we can use. All right. So, so if we're making the client as HTML5 on browser, the first thing you usually start with is what game engines can we use? So these are some of the suggestions that I put also on the bounty. These are mostly JavaScript frameworks, Phaser, Babylon.js, which is a 3D engine. Phaser is a 2D engine. A-Frame, which is more for VR and AR. And I think this is Hilo or Hilo. This is made by uh, the Alibaba team in China. But it's, an, it's a cross-platform to the game engine as well. And, uh, and again, you need to use open standard for asset formats because this really actually helps a lot when you're 
uh, and you're using them already or you're changing them and you have the tools that you because if you're using a data format that's very close like FTX for example you'll need to use uh, a lot of converters to get them in your game and using data formats open data formats like GLTF and JSON will allow you to use like open source code to put them to get them running in your game so I put up an example of the, the flappy bird game this, this example is actually one of the examples provided by Hilo and if you can just go and click on this you'll be able to see an HTML5 game running. So it's essentially Flappy Book. <laughs> so bad. It's just Flappy Bird, an HTML5 version of Flappy Bird running on your browser. Nice. You're better than the, the uh, GIF that you had in your presentation. <laughs> yeah. It's an, it's an easier version, I think. They all have their <laughs> variation of how hard it is. Yeah. And I put the source up over for this game using running Hilo on our GitHub, which is github.com slash alto dash io and slash funding the future. And if you guys want to check out more examples of Hilo, there's a link over there. But yeah, but all the other engines are pretty good that I've listed. Babylon JS is one of the better ones, I think. But it's very, it's very rich, so it takes a while to make a game on it. Wesley says he's they've been using Phaser for their project. Yeah, I, I think I saw one of them. Oops, okay. what's happening? Another question from the chat, is there a game on the App Store that HTML, HTML5 cannot run? Hmm. I think their, their dependency, the dependency there is like what hardware functionalities does the game have? For example, uh, like AR, for example, some, there are, the like the SDKs for allowing AR on browser aren't that fully functional yet. So it might not work if you're making an AR game that's uh, that's very that uses a lot of the phone's hardware. But nowadays I think a lot of the games that you can see on the app store can be done on a browser. Like three D, two uh, D, a lot of the APIs that talk to the servers. Those can those are already possible on browsers that you don't really have to make a native game to to. You don't really have to make a, a native APK game to be able to make the kind of game that you want. Got it. Cool. All right. So so the next part is the multiplayer server. So. There are actually a lot of frameworks that you can use if you want to you want to be able to support leaderboards or actual real-time multiplayer gameplay. And this is the one that we use, an open source uh, multiplayer server by Heroic Labs. It's called Nakama. There are some others that are pretty functional as well, like Colicious and Landsat.gg. These ones are Node.js based. And uh, to avoid being tied up to uh, to an account in a closed platform, we can use, uh, as most of us already use now in Web3, decentralized authentication of public and private keys. So in HTML5 Web3, we can use uh, MetaMask and Scatter or some other of the or any of the authentication libraries that we, we see, like for this Fortmatic. And then for hosting, it, it's good to use DevOps. DevOps best practices, so we're not locked in. So use containers like Docker if possible, and then virtual control deployment, which is um, so you can easily port it to any different infrastructure if you need to. So I put up uh, a Docker 
file, a Docker Compose of Nakama over on our repository as well, if you guys want to check out how to get that running. So it's essentially just running Docker Compose up and then it's going to put up a, a, a Nakama server running on your local workstation. But it takes a, a Docker install, so it, it might take a while. All right, so, and then lastly is we need to deploy on the web. And then when you're deploying on the web, usually just use your own URL, just upload it on a URL of your choosing and on an infrastructure of your choosing. And uh, use the centralized storage where it makes sense, like IPFS or Skynet. So currently, a lot of game developers actually haven't started using these decentralized storage options because um, because it's really easier to just use the current CDNs. It doesn't really cost a lot. But if it makes sense, then use it on your app. And then, do you, do, yeah, like, sure. what, what do you think the benefit would be? Like, how would you try to convince a game developer that it's, is it worth it? Do you think it's worth mm -hmm. it yet? Are there, are there things that Web3 needs to do to, to catch up to, let's say, the Dockers of the world? Mm -hmm. Well, um, our challenge with using decentralized storage like IPFS and and Skynet is it's the tooling isn't really that mature yet. And sometimes also when you want to stream something, if you want to stream assets to, to players, it has to be pretty fast because players are really impatient. So when yep. you use these IP with this decentralized storage, it takes a while actually. I think the infrastructure isn't there yet. But for things like, uh, for example, NFTs, where the assets have to be decentralized, then it makes sense. And usually yep. NFTs aren't really used immediately. Like they're, they're used for trading, for example. Right. So that's fine to use them. At least not yet. <laughs> not yet, yeah. Yeah. So when, um, yeah. When it reaches there, then yeah. when, when it just, makes sense, yeah, use them. Right. Small anecdote about Saya Skynet. They just did an exclusive hackathon and got 39, maybe 40 submissions in two hmm. weeks. So their project, I think, fantastic. Technically, I think they have like a lot of great benefits that kind of mirror what you might see um, from the Dockers of the world. And mm -hmm. uh, really strong team, great community. I, I'm very bullish on yeah. their yeah, ability. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I was checking it out like a few days ago. I think it's pretty cool. Yeah, I'll drop a link to, to the projects that were built. There's some really cool stuff. So I'm optimistic on the tooling and the things that their community can do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and then the last part, when we were discussing decentralizing app stores, we were talking about how do we keep monetization? How do we keep layer discovery? So for app payments, you can still use, I, for app payments, most, you can, you should use cryptocurrency rather for, to decentralize away from in-app. So we see that already happening in some of the blockchain games wherein uh, you're able to use cryptocurrency to buy NFTs. And then maybe eventually we can use cryptocurrency for in-app purchases as well. When, uh, when it's easier for players to do so. And then you can still use the app stores also if you really need to. Uh, as I said, you can still deploy an app stores that still increased users. Like you can make your game HTML5 and have a version for it on the app stores that still uses, uh, you still uses these other payment systems, as long as you have your own decentralized one. So I shared a source. Oh, oh you may not need smart contracts also. Like um, when you were making cryptocurrency payments, there are actually APIs that you can just use for just sending out money and just creating a wallet account, for example, that can send these out. So I shared an example of that on, also on our GitHub and a demo link here as well. So it's very similar to 
what Leon shared last night where you just put in an ETH wallet here and when you click claim it's gonna claim it so there's no smart contract code happening here it's mostly just um, a server with a private key that only you know and then uh, mm -hmm. and then there's an API that would need to be authenticated as well that will send these ethereum to the to the wallets that win them mm. So, so could you theoretically like build this um, on top of Bitcoin or using Bitcoin without even yeah. having to touch Ethereum? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and I think that's what we're that's what we want to do. Also, is to try to try to make all of these cross platform. So yeah. we, we use off chain when it makes sense. Use this on chain when it makes sense. Yeah, and I noticed this in Leon's demo today. It seemed like he wanted to make it extensible. Um, it's just so that any game developer can like easily bring the payments into their platform. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So a lot of game developers don't really know Solidity, for example. So I guess tools makers, it's up to us to make it easy for them to use. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, so yeah. So if anyone has questions on the code, just reach out to me. I'll, I'll be sharing my my info later. So I guess just to recap on everything that was discussed, uh, decentralization of video games is really a, a big problem. It's it takes us to analyze the economics of what's happening in in the industry, and we have to identify points of centralization and how we can fix them. So we only touched on the game engine and the back end. But there are some, some parts of the industry like ad networks, they do provide value like user discovery and monetizing free to play users and social networks and analytics. And these parts may be areas where we can look at how to decentralize and make it more, I guess make the economics make sense more for players and yeah. developers. Yeah. I'm curious if you've seen anything specifically on the ad network side that you've found intriguing in terms of how that could be better, um, let's say, yeah. better built around the, the game. Mm -hmm. um, not so much. Probably Brave, uh, the authentication token, but I think that's the one that makes, I, I guess because it has the scale that that makes sense for developers to use it but in terms of like how players play games or how they watch ads i haven't seen anything really very yeah. innovative yet yeah the, i mean I've, I've had conversations with a couple of ad networks um a couple of months ago um during san francisco blockchain week um coming from from the advertising the digital marketing side of things of game development um a lot of them are actually um you know, are kind of like in a stasis, stasis right now. Um, so the way they monetize players, whether it's a casual game or a mid-core game or a hardcore game, even um, it's it's still the same from the from the beginning of time. Um, it's you know the movement somehow is based on you know the, how better the creatives becomes for ad networks when it comes to serving ads, serving video ads, to players. But the whole chunk of how they monetize is still allowing you to watch ads for you to increase, you know, have an extra life, for example, or or get something in return from the game itself. So it's it's it they I believe they they still do increase the lifetime value of the users, but not to the extent that still that it, it outweighs the the user experience um, that we're getting when we're playing a casual game, which is. You win, you watch an ad. You lose, you watch an ad. So yeah. it's just basically very disruptive. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, so to end, I just want to go, go through the bounties that we have on Gitcoin and uh, just maybe talk a bit more about them. And if anyone has questions, I can, quick questions, I can answer them. So the first one is uh, create an open source HTML5 game with crypto payout so 
here at OP, where we have an example game that we have called the uh, World of Minds, which is a, a Unity game that we where we added uh, crypto tournaments. But we want to be able to share something that uh, developers that just are getting started into making an HTML5 game to uh, to use as a reference. So so this is why we created this bounty. So we wanted uh, hackers to look at what kind of HTML5 games they can make and to add crypto payout to it so people can understand how how we can still monetize these games even if they're like played on a browser. And then the second one is uh, use decentralized finance to create crypto payout for non-blockchain games. Because uh, as we said, a lot of the game developers that we talk to aren't really deep into blockchain. They don't know what decentralized finance is, for example. But when us being in this space, uh, seeing what innovations there are happening in East Denver, for example, we see a lot of these financial instruments that might be able to to be able to become mainstream in game. So we want hackers to take to think how can we add more into how games are monetized. Maybe it can be ads. Maybe it can be a replacement for ads, for example. Or maybe it can be just in-app purchase using uh, DeFi. But uh, the more ideas we have around this, the more we'll be able to find something that works. And, really cool. Uh, that's very cool. I, I want to see someone use um, like Sablier or, or, or some of the, the payment streaming um, oh, yeah, I saw services that, yeah. in, a, in a game. I think that would be really cool. Yeah, oh, it's like you're streaming micro, very, very micro transactions, right? Like real time. Mm. Yeah, something yeah. Like that would be cool. You know what? That really that brings that up in my mind as like something we could do after the hackathon. We have some budget from the Ethereum Foundation to do just interesting bounties. And Paul from Sablier, uh, he's he's kind of a friend of the community. He's put up a lot of interesting bounties. So that could be another one we do later. Yeah, sounds cool. And and yeah, so if you guys want to reach out, there's my email. Uh, this is our site. We're on Twitter as well. But I can take questions now also and just reach out to me in, on Twitter as well. Yeah. Cool. I should I should say everyone who stayed ten minutes late. Thank you. I, I should take uh, responsibility for asking so many questions. We I think should have booked forty five um, for for Paul. He's he's a great resource and thank you for taking the time. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Just just ask me questions. I'm always here to answer them. Awesome. There are yeah. two in the chat. If you want to answer them, right. um, Connor, do you want? You can take it away if you want. Yes. So I guess the, the first was any example of a game using DeFi for a non-blockchain game? Which... Oh, no, I don't think so. Yeah. Hmm. Um, yeah, so maybe a lot of them, yeah, I don't, I don't think there are. Like, if you think about Pull Together, it's technically a game. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I guess if you use DeFi, it ends up being a blockchain game yeah. somehow, but yeah, you can say that, maybe, but, you know, yeah. you, you use some, some like fiat integrations, people can swipe their credit card and then, you know, play poker through smart contracts, but they don't mm -hmm. know it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's and, one important thing. Players don't need to know it, right? If they don't mm. want to go deep into what the centralized finance is. They just want to play. Mm -hmm. Totally. Um, are you are you are you familiar with um, Virtue Poker? I know they're they're a consensus uh, consensus spoke that have been working for a couple of years on on a you know blockchain based poker platform that I'm really excited oh. about to go live. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I want to check it out also. Yeah. But I like playing poker offline. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, you know, and in in you know this day and age, you got to adapt. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Social distance uh. poker. <laughs> yeah. um, does oh. anyone anyone on the call like is anyone working on these bounties? I, I think a few people were, but even if you don't have a question, I, I'd love the 
elevator pitch on, on what you're trying to build? Okay, that to answer the, just the question on whether a winning submission requires to use a game server or just use smart contracts. Smart contracts is fine. This is for the challenge, second challenge, right? So we just want to see like, how are we going to use DeFi? But a demo would really help so we can really see how it works. Definitely. Demos are much appreciated from all, yeah. all participants. Um, cool. Any other questions or folks want to share what they're working on? VB Streets, congrats. You won the MidHack uh, prize oh, earlier today. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I'm glad. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I know right awesome now work. you're working on Ethereum Classic right now, but maybe later <laughs> you can work on some OP game stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Cool. Awesome. Cool. Awesome. All right. Yeah. Well, uh, I appreciate everyone who stuck around for an extra fifteen minutes. Um, I know these these often go a little bit long, but it's always fun to uh, to stick around and just to, to to see where things go. And thank you for everyone who's here at at two a.m. or nine or nine p.m. or whenever, because I know time zones it's got a little wonky on this one but uh I, I appreciate everyone's attendance and paul thank you for for getting up early and and giving us this thank talk. you guys was no really problem. Helpful. yeah thank you for hosting you, us. Chase. yeah anytime Cheers. yeah cool. if you so guys we'll, have any questions just let us know awesome yeah the uh the uh chase and paul have been really active in in uh gitcoin chat and of course we can always connect you with them if you have any questions um, yeah, and look out for this uh, recording on YouTube, hopefully first thing tomorrow. So uh, it'll be out there and hopefully people that weren't able to join because of the time uh, will be able to watch it there. Awesome. Thank you guys. Awesome. And you guys have a wonderful day and good awesome. morning. You as well. All. Good evening Cheers. to everyone. Good day, everyone. Yeah. Yeah. All stay right. safe, everyone. <laughs> good bye morning. Bye. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> Whatever time you are in, stay safe. <laughs> all right. Bye -bye. All right. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Bye, bye guys. Bye-bye.